Hello, and welcome to another fantastic Noman live stream. I know what you're thinking. Chris, you keep changing locations. What's up with that? Well, before I tell you what's up with that, if you're looking for closed captionings, make sure to head over to our Facebook or our YouTube, and we're all set up for you right there. So, I get it. Chris went into the future, last stream, he had uh, some cool setup at his house. Sometimes he's at the Noman Library, but today he's in a very interesting spot. Well, why are we here? What's going on? Well, as you all know, we have some fantastic new sponsors, Dell and NVIDIA. And because of that, we've been thinking, man, we gotta really take this to some new levels and new places and see some different things. And I thought to myself, one of the things that's really been interesting to see come up and evolve over the years as far as a lot of media and stuff that I watch as a fan is concerned is some amazing landscapes that they have for some of these TV shows and movies that are coming out. Amazing landscapes and stuff like Mandalorian and Obi-Wan. And I was such a big fan that I got really into some of the behind the scenes stuff. And in getting into a lot of that, I learned about volumes and you get to see right behind me that we're actually standing in one. No, I didn't go into the future even though my Time Machine DeLorean is on its way. I'm working on it, I'm trying. I just need the puffer jack and the hyper dunks. If anybody wants to help me out, go ahead and uh, hit me up. You know where to reach me. But they had all of this set up and I still didn't quite understand how it worked. Luckily, there's a fantastic volume out here in Chatsworth and I was able to come and see it live. And that's where we are right now. now. There's a lot more intricacy and a lot more stuff that goes into one of these volumes. And to explain a lot of that and to walk us through all of it, well, here's Addy. Hey, what's up, Chris? Hey, how's it going? Good to see you. Good to see you. I don't know. We were going like, you know, <laughs> yeah. it's always, it's always different. How are you, how are you doing? You excited? I'm excited. Yeah. I've been a big fan of Noman for a long time. I actually went to the campus a few times for some conferences. Oh, cool. And I know you've been here before. So welcome back. Oh, thank you. It's always a pleasure to be here. Now, before we get into it and everything, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Now, yeah. when you were a kid, did you just like always want to get into <laughs> screens and this was a thing or, or how did you even get into this and tell us a little bit about your journey. Absolutely, yeah. Well, when I was a kid, these actually didn't exist. So uh, my background is from feature animation. I worked at DreamWorks Animation for a long time. And then I was part of a small team there that did motion capture, you know, with the dots. And oh, the yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Avatar 1 days. And that sort of led me into the early days of virtual production. So in the early days when we didn't really use LED volumes, we were doing what's called camera tracking and virtual camera scouting. Okay. So it's tracking that camera with motion capture technology and then seeing it on a monitor, sometimes called a simulcam. Okay. That's the exact technology is actually used for Avatar 2 and 3. So they don't really use LED volumes, but it's still a virtual production. And fast forward to today where I'm with Disguise, we're doing full on LED volume work in very, very large stages, stuff that's way bigger than this. Yeah, and it's always fun, even coming here, and I understand like this is a, a small stage. Small stage. But uh, we got our cameraman behind the camera over here, and when we walked in, I mean, that, that jaw was on the floor. We had to pick <laughs> it up and bring it all the way over here. Yeah. Now, I know there's a lot more intricacies that go into this. It's not just a screen. There's a lot of things happening. So I'm going to go ahead and let you talk to them and walk yeah. them all through it. I'll see you in a bit. All right, sounds good. Yeah. Hey everyone, I have an excellent presentation for you today. So here at Disguise, we teach a program called the Virtual Production Accelerator. And what that is, is a four day program where we can take you through the very beginnings of what it takes to skill up in this environment, all the way to shooting on it. So we're gonna be able to use all of this technology to make content. I think that's the most interesting part, is how do you apply all of this to make film or TV or commercials or what have you. So I don't have four days right now. I'm not gonna live stream for four days. I think that would be insane. What I'm gonna do is compress some of that into about 30 to 40 minutes and give you a taste of what we teach here. So I have a slide that's, if you're able to see, and I'm gonna just tell them to advance it. So next slide. Awesome, so a little bit of background on my company and what we do. We're a global platform, a tech platform that builds the hardware and the software to power stages like this. We have a ton of stages around the world. As a matter of fact, we have about 350 
stages, maybe smaller, maybe bigger than this. And out of the 350, about 100 of them are doing exactly this stuff, film and TV. Next slide. So Disguise is known for powering many types of content and doing it seamlessly. One of the big usages for us is driving plates. So if you watch uh, any movie in the recent years and you see an actor in a car, chances are that car is in a volume like this and not actually on the road. And that volume is being powered by Disguise. In addition to 2D plates, we have another thing called 2.5D, which I'll get into. It's very interesting. And of course, we power Unreal Engine, which is what's running behind me. So if I'm walking here, you could see that the perspective is changing and everything. And that's happening in real time, in engine, as we like to say. And of course, all of the professional tools are built around this content. So we have color workflows. We have compatibility with other technologies and so on. So Disguise is a complete package for your stage for you to then make your content with. We have over 1,500 integrations. I know it's a lot and we don't have time to go through each one of them. So I'm just gonna throw out a bunch of logos at you and you could sort of tell that we work with most major technologies out there. So not just Unreal, but Unity as well. And Notch is another engine that we work with. Any major cameras like Ari or Red and so on. We even work with motion capture, yeah, my past <laughs> motion capture technology. So Move AI is a big one, and then Vicon and OptiTrack and so on. At the heart and soul of our system is a software called Designer. And Designer is supposed to be your one-stop show control for a volume like this. You can actually use Designer for not just film and TV, but also for live events. Disguise powers some of the biggest concerts in the world. Today, I can think of the Taylor Swift tour, which is powered by Disguise, the Adele residency in Vegas, powered by Disguise, the Drake tour, powered by Disguise. So yeah, we're everywhere. Our servers and our software power some of the biggest, baddest shows on the planet, in addition to some of the high profile film and TV shoots. Next slide. And how we connect to game engines is with a technology called RenderStream. So this creates a render cluster. So if you have one machine to power, let's say, Unreal Engine for a small TV, imagine a wall this big, you're gonna need a lot more machines. And we make a technology that makes a data center almost in your server room. So you can power Unreal Engine with the power of many, many GPUs. And we do that seamlessly, so you don't have to control them individually. You actually have control over that entire stack. Not gonna get into all of our software portfolios today, but we have not just designer and render stream, but we are also big players in broadcast. Um, as a matter of fact, we just uh, announced that we are powering the ESPN Sports Center stage in Bristol, Connecticut. That is being powered by our broadcast side of the technology, which is called Porta. And in addition to Porta, we also have APIs, so professional developers can connect right into our software and write custom tools. And we also have an up and coming cloud platform for media management. Next slide. And again, all of this technology is really not just about the technology. It's about using it and leveraging it to empower shows. We have an incredible support team, about 14 offices worldwide, and we are constantly picking up the phone for shows, concerts, broadcasts all over the world. And so we're all about empowering your show. Switching gears into what I love to teach and do, I see VFX, in-camera visual effects. Everything that you're looking at, as a matter of fact, the camera that's pointed at me right now is using that same methodology. So let's get into it. We did just did a quick project here called Hi, and it was a proof of concept for a feature film that used this very stage. And I have some footage to show you. Okay, let's go full screen on that.
Excellent. And yeah, there's a little bit of BTS there. So just showing some action from the stage while the movie shoot was going on. We could skip it. Awesome. And another project that I'm super proud of, I got to create a short film using this very stage called Space Rider. Space Rider is actually out uh, right now for film festival. So we are in the process of submitting to a, a few festivals. So super excited about that. And we'll share some of those learnings with you on this course. Okay, and I believe we have the trailer here quickly. Yeah. Every beast I pursue, I capture. Excellent. Thank you. And again, those, both of those films were made using in-camera visual effects. So it's the art of pointing a very real traditional camera and lens kit at a wall like this and getting the right perspective, the right lens characteristics and everything else that comes with a physical shoot, except you're in a virtual location. So what is ICVFX? I think the main thing that it comes down to is what the camera sees. When you create content from a stage like this, it's always about looking through the camera and through the lens to see what you're looking at. So you always have to remember that it's not just about crafting the frame with your eye, but it's actually what the camera is getting. So with that said, cameras and lenses play a big role in a stage like this. It's not just about the panels or Unreal or Disguise. It has as much to do with the Ari or the RED or the Sony, for example, as well. And LED content is really meant to replace a traditional physical background. Next slide. So the reason ICVFX is important is because it saves, if done correctly, a ton of money. And imagine if you are you know, trying to shoot a science fiction movie then you are creating very expensive environments in visual effects and you're doing a lot of it in post with green screen so you're compositing, you're chroma keying. ICV effects eliminates a lot of that process so you get that shot right then and there when you're shooting. If you're using a car process then you don't have to take the car out to a busy street, close off the street, get permits. You can now just be in an air conditioned sound stage with your actors and you can shoot it over and over again till you have the right shot. So ICVFX solves a lot of problems for productions, both logistically and financially. And that's the reason it has such big promise. The other big thing about in-camera visual effects with volume work is lighting and reflection. So when you're putting an actor, so I'm in a volume now and all of the lighting that I'm being impacted by is coming from either a practical light or the ceiling or the LED wall. And these are really important things because it's completely immersing me into this world. If you do a traditional green screen VFX pass, you're having to add all of that in post, which sometimes could be really, really expensive. And then finally, having the directors and DPs make onset de decisions. Right now, if you are doing a VFX heavy shoot, everybody is just looking at tennis balls on sticks and a giant green psych, and it feels a little disconnected and a lot of the production is done in post. So a lot of the decisions are done in post. With ICVFX, the DP has direct say in lens choices in frame composition, and the director has direct say in the actor performance because he can see it right then and there. It's not gonna change much. And finally, the actors themselves, when they see themselves in the world they are trying to act in, that gives them a natural performance uh, boost. And actors will always say that LED volume work is gonna be a lot better than green screen work. 
There are two terms that are typically associated with LED volumes that you'll hear. So one is virtual production or VP and the other is extended reality or XR. They're both about the same with some few differences. So XR is actually the process of taking what we have here in camera visual effects and adding set extension which is extending the digital set beyond the physical limitations, the physical specifications of the volume. So if you were to pull this camera way, way, way back, you would be able to see the edges of the volume. But using set extension, the edge of the volume blends seamlessly with the digital set, so it feels like the shot can go on forever. And then the other thing XR adds is augmented reality objects. So if I were to have a car or a motorcycle that's completely digital, doesn't exist in the real world in front of me, well, you could do that with XR. XR is used quite a bit for concerts and for broadcasts, whereas VP is commonly associated with in-camera VFX for film, TV, scripted content that you really want to hone in, take your time, and get the quality right. All right, so quickly I want to mention video plates. Like I said before, Disguise is used for a lot of video plate work, and video plate work, quite frankly, is a lot of virtual production. This is the stuff that's bread and butter. So before we get into Unreal work, I think it's easy to build up confidence with video plates. And video plates is also, there you go, there's a video plate right behind me. So I'm not in a car right now, but imagine me in a car driving. <laughs> This is playing back uh, a stitched video, a 360 stitch video from about six different cameras. And each camera is uh, an, you know, a real practical camera and a 360 stitching software or disguise can stitch it into a 360. What's neat about video plates is you can change the angle at which the road is changing or you can change the playback frame or you can change the speed or color. So it has some adjustability to it, and you're not having to build this entire world in a 3D game engine. So it, this is as simple as taking a camera out, putting it on a car, and then shooting that plate. So video plates, super important, really easy to get into, and one of the big use cases for virtual production. Cool. Let's go to the next slide. Awesome. And uh, one more, <laughs> sorry, Sam. thank you. There are some considerations in creating video plates. So there are professional video plate companies that make just do this. Uh, the plates that we got this from are from drivingplates.com. There's a few others. Uh, so I have the picture of the car here to show you how the camera's laid out. So I think they're using about 10 or so cameras and you could see that the cameras are not all clustered together on the roof. And there's a very good reason for that because when you put that stack of cameras on the roof, all of a sudden your perspective, your nodal point is at the top of the roof. So when you play it back on a volume, everything looks too high. So it always has to be at the perspective of the driver. So at about eye level when you're sitting down in your car. And because of that, these cameras have been split into two different groups and then lowered into where the windshield is. So in post, they take all those offsets into account so they can stitch a perfect 360 together. The other big thing that is tricky about video plates is uh, stabilizing the image. So both mechanically and then in post. Mechanically, these cameras are riding on some dampers and gimbals to kind of lessen the blow of the road and then in post, you have image stitching software that could actually do image stabilization using uh, machine learning. So combining those two gives you a really, really smooth plate. Okay, and then I have another background behind me, which I'll get into in a bit. Okay, next slide. So if you wanna get started with driving plates, and we do a lot of that here during the virtual production accelerator, start with 360 plates. Just take a 360 camera out in the real world so you don't have to stitch it. It already comes you know, in a lat long format. And then understand that just because you have the plates up there doesn't mean you're done. You also have to match lighting and you have to match reflections. You have to match the panel layout. So I have a picture here of our partner Fuse who does a lot of driving plates. And you can see there that there is a entire panel on top of the windshield. The reason they're doing that is to just get really nice reflections in camera. 
So you have to play around with the configuration of the volume as well as the content itself, if that makes sense. Okay, next slide. And one more. All right, so 2.5D. I talked about this a little bit, so let me explain what this is. Next slide. Okay, so a lot of times uh, when you're shooting video plates, if you have your camera in a static position or if you're not doing a big camera move, it's fine. You can't really tell that the content is flat. However, if you are on a dolly or anything that requires the camera to move in space or even move around a corner, immediately breaks the illusion because flat plates don't have parallax and our eyes are really susceptible to looking at parallax. So how do we do this? So we create fake parallax by layering up stacks of video one on top of another. So think of it as a cardboard cutout. I have a 2.5D project running here. So if you look behind me, there are several layers of buildings and each building is like a cardboard cutout. And the reason it's done that way is when I go through a move and maybe, Jacob, you just dolly the camera a little bit rather than, yeah. So I'm not sure if you could see this on camera, but as the camera is dollying behind me, there's a little bit of parallax that is evident. And just that little nuanced bit is all you need to convince your eyes that you're looking at a real world and not a flat TV. So 2D and a half D is a step up from 2D, but not quite 3D. It's still a lot cheaper and sometimes a lot easier to create than a full you know, world in a 3D environment. It does have a lot of limitations, like video does, that you can't really change it all that much. However, for some shots, it's more than good enough. Next slide. So on the screenshot there, I have our designer project running 2.5D. You could kind of see the different layers of the city, and you can see where that camera is at the very front, and then the bottom image is what I call the in-camera. So in-camera, everything looks fine, right? All the layers stacked up and aligned nicely. However, if you look at all the different layers, it's pretty easy to tell that they're completely separated by distance and depth. All right, next slide. Okay, and one more. Okay, getting into the actual camera and the lens. Next slide. Awesome. Without getting too much into it, and I could talk about this for hours, a camera sensor is a semiconductor device, kind of like a CPU or a GPU. It's doing something very different, however. It's collecting photons onto the chip, and then it's emitting a voltage, depending on how bright or dark that photon is. So for a sensor for on a RED camera, for example, that is 6K, you have 6,000 different columns across and about three, 4,000 different rows across. So it's about you know, a few million pixels on a surface area that's about 35 millimeters. So really, really small pixels. And it has to pick up light in that small surface area. Sensors are incredible device. They've come a long way. However, they still don't have the dynamic range that is needed to get uh, the full dynamic range of our eyes. Next one. So speaking of dynamic range, you hear the term HDR a lot. Well, I think it just equates to high dynamic range or sometimes called 10 bit. So that's giving us a little bit more headroom to fit more dark areas and bright areas into the image, highlights and shadows. In this example here, if I have an 8-bit image and you could see clearly that the, the path down the middle is quite blown out because of full direct sunlight. And then if you use HDR encoding and you have more bit depth, more dynamic range, now all of a sudden you're able to get more detail out of that same image. So dynamic range is typically measured in stops and that comes from the world of photography where you know the stop on a lens and so on. So a, a cinema camera right now is about 17, 18 stops or so um, uh, on a, any given camera. Our eyes, however, are much, much more dynamic. Our eyes are anywhere from 23 to 24 stops. So uh, the cinema camera still sort of have to catch up to the performance of our eyes. The other thing we'll get into during the VP Accelerator, and we spent a little bit of time on this, is shutter speed and shutter angle, which has a lot to do with virtual production stages. Uh, film cameras used to have a mechanical disc spinning in front of the exposure, 
because that is what limited the light and actually created or eliminated motion blur. So if that top GIF that I'm looking at, 180 means half circle, and 180 half circle spinning gives you about the right motion blur that you need for a film, 24 frames a second. Now, if you're using film to capture very, very high speed action, let's say, um, you know, a race car or a basketball player, and you need to track that motion really, really nicely without much motion blur, well, you're gonna wanna limit the amount of light per exposure. And the way you do that in the old days is you actually have a very smaller slit on that circular disc. Today's cameras don't have spinning mechanical discs on them, at least not that I'm aware of. So how they're done is actually with electronically controlled uh, shutter. And there's an example of that at the bottom there. So even that's using like a mechanical shutter. Uh, we don't even have that anymore. So it's just electronically controlled read lines. And we could sort of simulate the old days of spinning disc behavior with newer electronic timing. And that's what shutter angle and shutter speed are. So for example, for a camera like a Red Komodo that's running 24 frames per second, generally the shutter angle would be 180 or shutter speed would be one over 48. And if you are shooting something other than film, let's say sports or broadcast, then you're gonna turn that up so you get less and less motion blur. Little touch on shutter angle and shutter speed. Awesome. And uh, I get into film quite a bit. I'm a big film aficionado, like celluloid film. And all of the formats and sizes that we're dealing with with digital cinema cameras actually come from the world of film. For example, our sensor sizes are 35 millimeter, typically. That's because film stock, the most commonly used film stock is 35 millimeter. There has been different film stocks. If you watch Oppenheimer recently, that was shot in 70 millimeter IMAX. When you go to bigger film stocks, it's just more expensive. The cameras are more, you know, they're more insane. And everything about that process is just a little too much. And then when you go to smaller film stock, the quality isn't there, the dynamic range isn't there. And uh, it's frankly just not good enough. So the right happy balance is 35 millimeter film. And that's been the standard for about 100 years or so. And that is why our digital cinema cameras are using 35 millimeter sensors. Okay, uh, there's a bunch of different sizes of digital sensors and the two on this chart that you should probably be aware of is Super 35, which I mentioned, and Full Frame, or sometimes called Super 35 Full Frame, which is slightly bigger than S35. So generally on any digital cameras, it'll be one or the other. Next slide. There are also standard mechanical lens mounts that you have to be aware of, as well as the optics themselves and what they do. We'll get into that quite a bit in the accelerator. Here, I just wanna point out some of the most common lenses that we see in virtual production. So the Cook S4 anamorphic, we all love the anamorphic look and it's, uh, it, it's what Space Rider used, it's what Hi used to shoot with. So that's going to use a PL mount, which is a very traditional mount from the film days. And uh, generally that is uh, also called a bayonet mount because so, it goes in and kind of clicks. And then we also have mounts from the modern photography lenses. So like an E mount is very common with Sony cameras. And then an EF mount, for example, on the Zeiss CP3 is very common with Canon cameras. So it's a mixture and combination of different lens mount, but don't worry. You have plenty of lens adapters for the different types of mounts. So if you have one or the other, you'll be just fine. Okay. And then switching gears into art department. Speaking of which, can you take me to another scene? While we do this, uh, I just want to point out the fact that I'm in a volume and it's really easy to just be transported into different worlds. And uh, the reason that we do this is well, that's the whole point of making film in virtual production, is to be able to do many, many things with one stage and in one place. When we shot Space Rider, we went through about 10 different Unreal environments in the course of five days. Uh, I couldn't imagine doing that on location. It would be insane to move a crew around location to location. Next slide. Thank you. 
So the virtual art department, or sometimes just called the art department, is all about creating those environments in the 3D world. And it follows a lot of the tradition of regular old world building, practical set building. So whereas you had matte painters and set painters and modelers, in today's world you have environment artists and texture artists and modelers. Next slide. The methodology in which a virtual art department team progresses goes from pre-production. So this is at the very beginning concepting the show, using the storyboards, creating animatics, to acid and prop matching. So now figuring out how real world objects match the virtual world objects and then tying it all together with origin and scale. And this also ties into traditional departments like production design and art department that is physical as well as virtual. So here in this example, th these are shots from the Space Rider film. We were concerned with scale and origin of some of the worlds we were building very, very early on. So you could see there's a sphere in that picture. That's because the sphere needed to be a certain size on camera versus a real sphere in the real world. So these are just some of the tests that we ran to make sure scale was really, really important. Okay? And then finally, once you're done with pre-production, so you can see some of the pre-production process here. It's very common storyboarding that's done in most feature films. Next slide. You take the storyboards, now you have to break it down into what is real, what is not real. It's a simple question. Next slide. So in this shot here, you know, the practical leaves in the foreground is something that we have to come up with. And then the background is something we have to build in Unreal and then throw it up on the volume. And those two things have to be stylistically the same thing. So in camera, it's seamless and it looks like one world. Okay. And here I have an, ex uh, go one more thing. Here I have an example of origin and origin is super important to align all those digital worlds and the set and disguise and unreal and the real world all together so you always pick an origin point of zero 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 in xyz direction and it's arbitrary we chose the middle of the stage there with the yellow dot on the left picture and that has to correspond across the board across all of your worlds. And so this is just a quick example of how we tie all of this stuff together. Um, go into the video, actually. Ooh. Oh, you know what? There is no video. So in this example here, the matching of that fake rock that our actor is leaning up against versus that same rock in the Unreal scene, the, we went through a LiDAR scan. We actually got the LiDAR scan of that rock, and that's what you're seeing in the Unreal scene on the left there. That is needed to make sure the Unreal world is built to the same scale and origin as the real physical stage. These two things are really important so that when you're looking through camera, all of a sudden you're not seeing a deep, very deep cave that you had no idea was going to happen. You want to be able to expect that all in previs, and then when you come on to set and shoot, it all lines up. All right, color science. Uh, a lot of fun for me, maybe not for a lot of people. Color science is something we get into as well in Virtual Production Accelerator. Here I'm just going to touch on some of the big topics and then if you have any questions I'll be happy to answer it. Okay. Now color science is really geared for our own vision system, our eyes and our brains. And without getting too much into it, our eyes are susceptible to two types of information, so brightness or luma and color or chroma. So our eyes are really good at actually picking up information in the dark lack of light regions and then not so good at super bright areas. So if you go outside uh, versus when you're inside. And then our eyes can also pick up color but not as well as that grayscale information. And because of this we break out our signaling into luma and chroma. So any uh, encoding system that encodes video or photos will use luma and chroma. Next slide. And one of the ways in which we save bandwidth is with chroma subsampling. If you heard 444, 422, 420, well, this is what it means. So the gray chart there is what the grayscale information or luma is. The chroma is the color information. You combine the two and now you get the final pixel, which is on the right column. You can actually throw away color information, that middle column, 
as much as 75%, and your brain will barely be able to tell that it's thrown away at all. That's because our eyes cannot pick up the nuances in color as much as it can the nuances in brightness or darkness. Bed depth is something we get into quite a bit. Um, you know, this is a very sort of exaggerated example. So that goes to show that an increase in bit depth also increases not just your dynamic range, but the gradation, the difference in value each time. So 8-bit generally has a 256 different discrete levels of value. You add two bits. So at 10 bits, you're at about 1,024. And then you add two more bits, you're about 4,000. So it's an exponential increase the minute you start adding bits. It's really fascinating. It's like a trade-off. Do I want more data, but I also get more quality, or do I use less data? So different things for different applications. In VFX, generally, because high, high uh, accurate computation is needed, you're going to use 12-bit or maybe even higher. However, for terrestrial broadcasts like TV, 8-bit is fine. We're moving into a world now where 10-bit is becoming pretty standard. Dynamic range, and uh, quite frankly, this is <laughs> something that I always, always work on understanding even more. Um, how do you grade and color given the dynamic range that you have? And here I have just some examples of what a vector scope is, what a waveform is, what a parade is. Uh, that image is being viewed through those devices. Those devices are all software. And what the output is, is how we can quantitatively tell what that image contains. And we go into linear versus log, one to use one, one to use the other. In this example here on the image um, that looks a little bit more grayed out and flat, that is a linear image. And the one that looks more contrasty is a log image. And the reason why your eyes prefer the log image, well, it's because of the way our eyes are designed. Our eyes really like to fixate on areas that are darker and really can't tell apart the information that is on the brighter side. And because of that, we can actually cheat the data usage to, uh, to favor the side of the image that's darker and spend more data there. And this is the primary difference between linear and log. So a log is a logarithmically encoded gradient, whereas linear is exactly what you think it is. You know, it's a very natural slope. We get into different color spaces. So here I have some primary color spaces, CMYK, RGB, HSL. What do they all mean? Well, they are all representing color just in different ways. In the same way that we can tell you how to cook something using different languages, we can also tell you the color of something using different color spaces. They all, at the end of the day, mean the same thing. Next slide. And we get into lookup tables. So lookup tables are quick and easy ways to transform or convert one color space to another or do cool things like day to night or get a film look. Lookup tables are not the magic bullet. They sometimes could be used really, really wrong. And we go over some of that as well. Lookup tables are a very simple mathematical computation. It's just uh, a matrix multiplication. So it's nothing fancy under the hood. Okay, And finally, we actually get into a live color grading session. So we take what we shot in the stage, and then we go through what it takes to match the color of the LED wall to the physical actor. It's an art and a science because the, the art part of it is making sure it looks good, having the eye for it. And the science part of it is not breaking the image, not breaking the, the gamut or the color space or the dynamic range and so on. We get into OCIO. So Open Color IO is a known image platform, image color platform. So it is um, right there on the website, opencolorio.org. Anybody can go and download it. It's uh, something that could easily plug into your software. As of now, most major software does support OCIO. And OCIO could then run many, many different color spaces on your software. So for example, if you're running Unreal, and you want to run Rec 709 color space, you want to enable the OCIO plugin and then build in the Rec 709 configuration within that plugin. Okay? Yep. And uh, we talk about color managing from Unreal all the way to the wall during the accelerator. Mm -hmm. 
We also talk a little bit about ACES. ACES is like OCIO in a lot of ways. It also has rules for color management and it's open source as well. The thing that's a little bit different about ACES is ACES also defines color spaces. So ACES has AP0 and AP1. Those are ACES color spaces in addition to the standard color spaces of REC 709, REC 2020, and DCI-P3, and so on. So we're gonna get into the differences between each of these, when to use one, when to use the other, and what color space is an absolute theoretical one. Uh, I'm just gonna break the spoiler here. ACE is AP0, it's a very theoretical color space, not quite useful just yet, but it is something that has uh, you know, one gamut to capture it all. All right, and we go through a working example of a color pipeline from content all the way to the wall using disguise. So you could see on this flow chart here that we have Unreal using OCIO, and then that OCIO config is replicated also on the Brompton LED processor, and then disguise is set to a pass-through mode through ACES, so it doesn't transform or distort any color information. It's merely passing it through. And then that's how you ensure color fidelity. There are many, many ways to do this. So we just show you one or two ways here, which kind of educates you on how to manage and handle color spaces when you're out on a volume on your own. All right, and one more. Okay, so one more. We get into the dynamics of what a crew does on a VP stage. And a lot of this was learned from our film shoot for Space Rider. So it's capturing that social dynamic and the production dynamic in a bottle and then teaching it to you. So if we were to break down the crew from that film and bigger film, bigger crews, but it's still the same three categories. You have technical, creative, and administrative. So the technical folks are gonna be your volume operators, your disguise operators, and so on. The creative people are gonna be your director, your DP, your actors, and so on. Administrators are gonna be producers, ADs, production coordinators and so on. So we need all three elements to build out a nice even crew. Great, next one. Actors have an incredible job, especially on a VP stage. They have to wrangle a lot of different elements. Their job is very difficult and we go through some of those examples. And when we shoot, we actually show you how difficult it is. All right, and another one. DPs, DPs do a fantastic job of blending the digital world to the real world if they understand what they're doing. Uh, a DP's job is to not just understand the cameras and the lens, but also understand lighting choices, frame composition, digital content composition, and physical uh, set changes. So all of those things are really, really dynamic on a VP stage, and a great DP can handle it all with ease. So we, I, we had Chris Darnell as the DP in Space Rider. He's never been on a volume before. And after about a day, he was very acclimated and he was able to make really good choices, which I think shows up great on our film. AD is also a super important role. So ADs do the hard job of managing the sheer chaos. Without an AD, the entire set would fall apart. An AD is making sure that the shoot is executed on time. People are where they're supposed to be. There is no gap in a sequential flow and so on. So for our shoot, we have Vivian here as the AD and we have her work in the shot list and the call list and everything else to show you during the accelerator. Next slide. Just remember to always trust the creatives. All of this technology behind me and in front of me is not just about technology. It really is about how it's applied and how the creatives use it. With Space Rider, the director, the writer, the DP saw the end product way before you and I could see it. That's because they had the vision and they could see through the technical layers. Um, just remember to always trust the creatives on a project like this, okay? And success in virtual production comes from a lot of pre-planning. I think some of you may have already heard this, but it's true. The more pre-planning you do, the more you invest up front, the more time you have up front, the easier the shoot is, and the less time you spend in post. In an ideal world, you have very little VFX or post because you have done all your homework in pre and everything is in the can during the shoot. Some of the misconceptions about virtual production is it's not always gonna be cheap. 
If you do this wrong, it can actually cost you more money. That's because this is a very expensive tool and stage rentals are not cheap and the Unreal scenes and artists are not cheap. However, it is cheaper than traditional VFX if you use it correctly. If you are able to pre-plan and shoot, then at the end of the day, you're able to almost eliminate most VFX that's generally green screened. So to minimize the risk on the day of, during a shoot, what you would want to do is build in camera test days, pre-shoot days, bring in your DP, your director, your writer, everybody in a stage like this ahead of time, get them familiarized, get the content up on the wall long, long before you actually have to shoot. And building in that breath of air before the shoot really helps make sure the shoot goes well. Okay, without getting too much into detail, I just want to cover what some of the big components of a stage like this are. Okay, so obviously LED panels, it's a pretty big one. We're running with the Rho BP2V2 panels here. We're actually in the Rho Visual Headquarters here in Chatsworth where these are actually made and serviced right behind me there. Um, LED panels are one of the most important part of this entire chain is because the color fidelity and the performance of the LEDs is going to show up on, on camera. And if you have inferior LED panels, it breaks the entire illusion. In this example here, if you go to the next slide, LED panels are comprised of a lot of different subcomponents. So you have the power supply, you have the receiver card, and then you have the actual modules themselves. There's actually four tiny little tiles that make up one panel. And these panels could then just stack up one against each other and appear seamless in the front. But we're running with about uh, 100 or 200 panels back here and it seems like it's one giant display. And that's the magic of LED panels. You can see here the pitch matters a lot with LED panels. So in this same square footage that I have on the screen, I have a 10 millimeter pixel pitch and there's about 100 LEDs. And then if I increase that pixel pitch to five, then all of a sudden I've quadrupled the number of LEDs. And then if I go down even Further, now it's 1,600 LEDs. So it's an exponential increase in the number of LEDs when you reduce the pixel pitch. And what that does on the back end is now you're having to power more pixels, which means you're going to need more rendering nodes and everything else. So complexity comes at a super high cost with LED pixel pitch. And a couple of the other big components on set is time code and jam or sync. Um, you got to remember, the LEDs are refreshing at their own pace. The camera is exposing at its own pace. Disguise is doing its own thing. Unreal is also rendering at its own pace. So to kind of synchronize all these things to happen at the same time, you need a unified time and unified signal. And that's what Genlock is. Next slide. So Genlock is uh, almost like a video signal without getting too much into it. It comes from the old days of TV, it's incredibly fast at megahertz speed, and most devices that are in a professional stage like this can read Genlock just fine. The other thing to remember is time code, which is essential for VFX work. So a lot of the stuff that we're going to record, VFX is going to take over. And for them to accurately sync everything across, they're going to need time code. Time code is like a clock but it's like a clock that's built into every device and then it burns that data into every frame. Camera tracking, another important aspect. So as I'm moving around here, and if you want to dolly over a little bit, Jacob, something is aware of where Jacob is moving the camera. And as Jacob's moving the camera, the perspective in Unreal is changing. This is all happening so fast, many, many times a second. What's happening here is there's a Stipe Red Spy camera tracking system that's shooting up at the world, and it knows where it is in 3Space. And as Jacob is moving the camera, it is aware of the change in that space. So it's sending that translation data to Unreal and Disguise, and both of those systems can then re-render and reposition their virtual camera. This is essentially what camera tracking is. It's an absolute necessity for in-camera VFX. There are two types of camera tracking systems. There is outside-in and inside-out. 
inside out is stuff like Stipe, what I just talked about, and there's another technology called NCAM and MOSIS, and outside in is when you have cameras on the outside of the stage looking at typically a passive marker. So those are generally from the motion capture world like OptiTrack and Vicon. All right, so getting into Space Rider, the production itself, and one more. So we wanted to make a story that had all the elements of, you know, classic sci-fi. You know, there was a big bad guy, there's a hero, and we wanted to be fun. And yeah, we were inspired by The Mandalorian. So we wrote about a 15-minute short film, and here is one of the storyboards from it. Next slide. These are some of the stills from uh, the shoot, and right away you can tell that we were getting pretty good quality right off the bat. Next slide. Here's a BTS, go ahead and play it back. Classic example of driving plate use in a VP stage. So we wanted to make sure all those classic examples of virtual production are in this film. So there was some technical consideration. At the same time, the creatives just wanted to tell a really ambitious story. So it was a combination of both. Okay, next slide. So some of the big creative decisions that went into Space Rider was avoiding the dark and gritty look that's generally associated with short sci-fi films. Um, embracing the 80s and 90s action film vibes, so having a lot of fun and putting in a lot of saturated colors and so on. Next slide. Some of the mood boards here, these are right from the show. So these, this is a very early process in which you're still trying to visualize what this world and what the characters look like. Next slide. And then it goes into asset exploration, then now looking at 3D assets and shaders and things like that to conceptualize what it would take to build this in Unreal, for example. Next slide. And then once we have the storyboard, here is the first sequence, the motorcycle sequence, then we can actually put it all together into an edit and put scratch dialogue on it, scratch audio on it, and call it an animatic, and you can actually view it as a movie. After you've done previs, now it's time for tech viz. This is a little bit more technical, no pun intended. It's because now there's actual measurements involved and this is where origin and scale really come into play. So you built this world, but is this world 100 meter wide or 10 meters wide? Well, it has to be a certain size in order for it to look correct on this wall. So tech viz is almost like fact checking against the real physical world in what you're building in the digital one. And then finally, we went into the shoot, which is sometimes called principal photography. So we used about eight different scenes on set and then a few more after. Uh, we used in-camera visual effects of about three quarters of the movie. And then the one quarter of the movie we shot in green screen and blue screen. And we used those beautiful Cook anamorphic lenses for that classic sci-fi look. So in a typical production, a lot of the stuff happens at the end, right? And this is the pre shoot and post block and in VP we say that you want to do a lot of the planning up front so the post is as small as possible and what really happened for us and I think this is the prediction for the future of film and virtual production is the pre and post are going to be about the same effort but there's going to be a seamless highway if you will between VFX in post and VP in pre. I think those two departments are going to connect in a way that is going to make sense as the movie loops. So the VP assets will get handed off to VFX or VFX is going to create the assets for VP so they have consistency once that entire thing is shot. We used Unreal for our film, so a lot of the Unreal scenes that we used for VP were actually just used for VFX because we went final pixel with Unreal Engine. Uh, a diagram of our team, so we had about 20 people during the shoot days, those five days, so obviously Jeff, our director, at the middle of it all, controlling what needs to be done, and then his primary right-hand person was Vivian, the AD. AD themselves had help, and then 
the director of photography had his own team of gaffers and so on. And then finally, the brain bar, if you will, the volume control was the VP supervisor, the LED technician, the Unreal artist, the disguise operator. So that is its own sort of uh, category of personnel on the shoot that day. Okay, and one more. So some of the methodologies that we used and uh, some of the Space Rider primary uh, sort of uh, motivations was to make this fully VP native, right? So how do you make an entire film in a volume? You shouldn't do that. It's probably not gonna result in a good film, but we wanted to try it just because it was a short film and we knew what we're doing with Unreal Engine and the volume. We weren't necessarily good at on-location shooting, but we were good at volume shooting. So we took that to our advantage. And then because we were based out of, of VP volume, we were rapidly creating assets and iterating on them very quickly. And the stuff that we just couldn't figure out, we just shot on green and blue screen anyway, so we can address it in post. We used a process called kit bashing, which is taking a bunch of different Unreal assets and mashing it together in a way that makes sense for your film and for your style. So and Epic has a thing called the marketplace where you can buy pre-existing assets for somewhat cheap. So for example, this planet that we use for the spaceship shots was $40. And so we bought the planet, the stars, the lens flare and everything else. And we put everything together in a matter of a week or two. Um, traditionally, stuff like that would take months as you have to create everything from scratch. You know, and for higher end films that require the absolute best look, you kind of do have to do that. However, we got away with using marketplace assets because it was an indie film, okay? And another sort of big motivation for us was to achieve Final Pixel with Unreal Engine. It's a game engine, it's a real time engine, so not necessarily the best choice for some things like particles and smoke and fire. However, for the shots that we picked, those weren't a big issue, so we could achieve final pixel with Unreal Engine. The advantage here was, like I said earlier, taking all the stuff that we built for the shoot and then just transporting it over for VFX and post. The other thing we were not afraid to use was 2D. 2D effects is so slept on. 2D with After Effects and all of its plugins is really, really helpful. So I have some frames here. So the hologram that Ryder swipes through in the spaceship is all 2D effects and After Effects. The snow element you could see in that middle frame is all from After Effects. The when we got out of the camera, that was the top frame there, and then we added a bunch of 2D elements like the laser and the snow, and we got to the look that we wanted. 2D can be good enough up to a certain point, for us, it was good enough. It was an indie short film. Um, for the most expensive, most big budget films, I think you're gonna have to do a lot of this in 3D. And Unreal, uh, we talked about leveraging Unreal for everything, so let's get into it. The advantage with Unreal is when you build a world like this behind me, you have control over every aspect of this world, so not just moving the rocks around, but changing the texture of the rocks where the cracks appear, changing the time of day, changing the foliage, all of the grass and everything else. Having that sort of control really gives the creatives the tools they need to create the world that they want. You don't necessarily get this kind of control with 2D plates or 2.5D. However, with building world in Unreal, there is a specialization. So Unreal artists have to be employed and hired to do all of this work. Okay, and one more. Excellent. Are we gonna get into an Unreal scene here? Yeah. So we're running Unreal now. And one more. There you go. And give me some focus on that camera. Excellent. Okay, so this is actually 
an unreal scene from the movie Space Rider. So we call this asset exterior ramen shop. So as Ryder drives his motorcycle into this ramen shop, this is where he parks his motorcycle and then he's about to walk into the ramen shop and then we transition to the interior ramen scene. So here, the in interesting thing here is that this is about three or four different marketplace assets. So for example, that spinning ramen logo is one asset. The actual building is one asset. And uh, if you s maybe pan over, you see some of the junk in the trash can there, that's another asset. So we just put things where they need to be as far as creative goes. And how we tie it all together is with lighting. So the lighting on here is completely from scratch. So we throw away all the lighting that comes with marketplace assets and we relight the entire thing from scratch. And that's how you get consistent lighting that is across all of those marketplace assets, if that makes sense. Okay, let's go back to the slides. And one more. Oh, all right, we're, <laughs> we're at the end. All right, I've got some QR codes here. Uh, we have two VP Accelerator courses in the US, so we have LA and New York. However, if you're around the world, we have them in London, and now we have them in Barcelona, and also Japan. So let us know which one you want to attend. And uh, we hope to see you in one of those. Chris, you want to come back here? I guess I, guess I can. <laughs> I mean, <clears throat> it's, it's so wild because, uh, thank you for that, by oh, the way. That was sure. fantastic. You go over it, you know, I've, I've, I've seen you uh, go over this a few times. Um, and it's always very exciting to hear it. But at the same time, um, my favorite thing to do when I'm here at the stage yeah. is like get a camera really close so you can see all the small pixels and then pan it out. Yeah, yeah, when you yeah. pan it out, it's yeah. really, really fun. And then hearing all the extra stuff. I mean, we, I was, you know, you were looking at the camera while you're going through a lot of stuff and probably as a, as somebody that's doing a lot of these live streams, the thing that would be really good for me to do is like pay attention to the stream. Uh, but what I was doing was I was watching our cameraman's face and you were saying certain things and he's just like, wow, <laughs> like he was like blown away. Cause I think it's one of those things where a lot of people, they can think of, man, if I had this, yeah. what, what right. the possibilities are almost endless. And you know? that, that feeling is gold. Yeah. Like that we want you here. Uh, I think the next generation of filmmakers, a lot of them Noman students, a lot of them will be Noman students. Yeah. This is your tool. Come learn this, use it, make the next Star Wars. So then in that, uh, I have a couple of questions for yeah. you. The, if somebody is like learning environment design and Unreal and all of that, how simple is the pivot into something like working in a virtual production stage like this? Very easy. So if you're already in Unreal, you're like 90% there because you understand 3D space, 3D geometry, limitations of graphical performance. So when you walk into it, the bit that you're learning is the panels, the camera tracking, the skies. So a lot of what we call stage tools, the content tools you've already conquered. And then as far as like when you're on set and you're working on a production, you know, a lot of times I think back in the day, people would film stuff in green screen and then they'd have to like really comp it really quick so somebody could see kind of what's happening. Yeah. Well, in this, it's, it's real time, it's, it's right? right there. So yeah. what's usually like the turnaround time? If somebody's like, yo, I hate that trash can, get that out of here and, and take this person, move them over there. What's yeah. the turnaround for that usually? Instant, check oh. this out. So <laughs> Unreal has a feature called multi-user editing where a bunch of people can log into one Unreal Engine session from anywhere in the world, really, over the network. And so, yeah, you could see that block is being moved. Oh, there we go. Yeah, I, I hate that block. Get that block out of here. <laughs> <laughs> you need to work on your directive voice. Yeah, it's, yeah. Not, it's not malicious enough. Get that block out of here. <laughs> <laughs> so what happened was, say, uh, um, Disguiser on the side, she is on an MUE session on that same render machine that the LED walls are using. So we have four machines here that are powering this wall and then say is on a fifth one. That fifth one is talking to the other four. Okay, so hang on, you, you, you mentioned 
remotely anywhere in the world. So let's say that, yeah. uh, say, had to go right now, yeah. uh, but had internet connection on a plane to log in and, yeah. and the connection was solid, oh. the computer is solid. On a plane, I, that's next level. So yeah. <laughs> all Say would need to do is create a VPN. Uh, you could use uh, very simple free VPN tools and the entire multi-user edit session would have to run on that same VPN. And yeah, you could literally traverse through whatever network the airplane is on into this Unreal Engine. That's yeah. that's that's pretty pretty intense. Okay, so then you you have this fully Unreal situation here. You yeah. have a 2.5D also in here that you can just switch to, yeah. and then also the the driving plates and all of that. Yeah. How does how do you get from making those assets and loading them in, and then like how does the bandwidth work in that? Does it ever yeah. like get too much? Like what's what's the back end look for something like that? It's all disguise. So that's that's the sort of power of disguise is being able to handle all the different types of content: 2D, 2.5D, 3D, all in the same system. So what Say is doing is right now she switched us out to this. This is a volumetric asset. Okay. It's not running in Unreal, it's actually running in Disguise. And then the 2D plates, 2.5D plates, they also just run in Disguise, so outside of Unreal. And then when we need that beautiful 3D world, well, we switch on Render Stream, which allows us to then start rendering in Unreal, if that makes sense. Yeah. yeah. The, the important thing here is when you are a creative, you're shooting a movie, you want to have all those tools under your belt because you want to have options when you're shooting. So, okay. I got all this stuff in Unreal, I'm working through all this, yeah. and I come in and I go, you know what? You know, this is cool, this is nice, but uh, I need some classic green screen stuff. Yeah. Do they talk to each other? Like, can you do that? Can I just be like, let yeah. me have a little bit of here. Oh, okay, here we go, right here. Yeah. So, but then, and then the light, you're still getting some pretty decent yeah. lighting from it as yeah, well. Yeah, so and also it sounds like screen. you've done some green screen in your life. So one of the big problems with green screen is green spill, right? So when, if this entire thing was blasting me with green, you, nothing would oh, make sense. I'm yeah. wearing white right now. There would, it would take a lot of VFX to get all that green spill out. The magic of LED volumes is what we call inner and outer frustrum. So this little box that you and I can see, the camera is thinking the entire thing is green. Well, the, just that bit is green. Everything else around me, the ceiling, the walls is not green. And what that's doing is it's putting in more of that incidental lighting versus the green light. And because of that, you get very little to no green spill. So when you take this footage of you and me on green to post, the VFX artist is gonna give you a big hug because he's gonna say <laughs> you, you pulled an amazing green and it's gonna make his or her job way easier. Yeah, I mean, it definitely yeah. looks like it for sure. And then again, the, the quick switch, I know yeah. Sato me on the side is just yeah. switching everything super fast as we're talking. Yeah. Uh, it's just really impressive. Now, I have some questions here. I actually came in with my own questions, so I was like oh, coming through, but we do have sure. questions that came in. And then of course, <laughs> Say, you in you there in the chat. take us back to Hyper Real? Yeah. yeah. If you're in there and you have any questions, go ahead and put them in. Uh, I know some of you have already been putting in questions. All right. the, one of the questions actually came from uh, working from home. So it was an interesting concept, but I think for pitching it to you, it, it's, it's interesting as well. Um, you know, work from home, they have all those like filters that they got going on now. Do you ever see this because it's such, uh, it's, it's so used right now and a lot of times whenever there's new technology, it gets used in like higher level and then it gets down to consumer level. Yeah. Do you see stuff like this being used or like disguised having like a home situation that you can go in and be like, today I'm gonna be in Miami, do, 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 and then all your walls change or something like, is yeah, that even possible? Yeah. I mean, we're seeing like what I call the democratization. We're seeing some of that now. So. We actually have a whole different side of our business that is for corporate. So like a hotel lobby. Yeah. Or like you walk into a bank and one of the walls is an LED wall. So we do a lot of that work. And corporate is really picking up. And the other area that we're seeing this film t technology kind of bleed into is location-based experiences. So theme parks. So theme okay. parks are now starting to use LED panels and things like that. It's gonna happen. I think the LED panels will drop in price so much so that you can just have one at home. Um, I know a few people who are running these like at a very small scale at their homes already. Huh. Yeah. So then you, 
you're saying is that let's say you were to go to a really exceptional art college in I don't know Hollywood California <laughs> that specialize in VFX animation and, and game art uh, there are a lot of jobs for you coming out if you wanted to work with your unreal knowledge yeah. in a lot of this stuff absolutely so when you learn vir like classic virtual production if there is such a thing is going to be you know, Unreal, Disguise, LED walls, camera tracking, like these elements, once you've mastered those elements, they could be used for live events, concerts, broadcast, uh, film and TV, corporate world. They even run these on cruise ships. Oh, cool. <laughs> <laughs> so, the, you know, it's whatever you want to get into. Okay, I think we, we have some more drive plates. How do you get from one loading? We already asked that. Uh, someone learns main environments, green screen with the volume together. Uh, so, so this is, I, I think this is a, a demo volume is what you, you yeah. would call this. Sure. But uh, Disguise, is, as you had just uh, alluded to and let us know, um, has uh, uh, other places that they teach people, but yeah. does that mean you have other volumes Oh, yeah. Around? Okay. We have, uh, so internally at Disguise, we have 12 offices worldwide. Each one of them have a volume in them. What's really cool is our customers have the most badass volumes. I'll give you some examples. So we have uh, an incredible volume in Denmark called Nordisk. We have one in Japan. Um, I'm not allowed to say their name yet, it hasn't launched. We have several in Korea, CJ ENM, Dexter. We have one in Singapore. We have one here in LA, Nan Studios runs Disguise. Um, we have Pier 59 in New York. So I guess what I'm saying is uh, we ourselves, because we make the technology, we're not actually making the shows. We're not going to have the biggest, baddest volumes, but our customers are, and they are doing some incredible work with this technology. Oh, yeah. We, uh, we went to Nant Studios as well. A yeah. lot of them uh, get to come through and experience a lot of the volumes in Nant is, whew, yeah. they got a serious studio right oh, there. Yeah. Uh, okay, so we have somebody uh, with a question that uh, graduated in architecture, moved into Unreal, self-taught. How hard do you think it would be for them to go back to movies, so virtual production? So they have uh, some Unreal knowledge, self-taught, yeah. and uh, they want to kind of pivot in. How, yeah. how would you... Well, you kind of, you kind of pivoted into virtual production. You Every, you I think we in. all did. Okay. Yeah, I, I think this industry hasn't, you know, didn't exist a few yeah. years ago. So we all sort of found our way into it. Architecture applies. Uh, we actually have somebody on our team named Carlos, who is also from an architecture background, is, is now a very proficient disguise operator and Unreal artist. So architecture, I think your brain works in 3D space. You're envisioning things in 3D, and now you already know Unreal. So that's an added step that you're much closer with. So the last step is to just learn these stage tools, learn color spaces, image encoding, like these little technical bits. But you're mostly good to go, believe it or not. And then uh, Carlos as well, just to tune up uh, a lot of his yeah. knowledge, came to know me. Yeah. Started taking some classes yeah, there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know? There you so go. It's, yeah. uh, you know, if, you, if just in case you were curious. Yes. Uh, let's see. So you were talking about the synergy between pre and post, and you see it coming up more and more. Sure. Uh, changing something in real-time engine and loading it back into a real. So where do you see the production benefits kind of happening? Where, how, are the, how is virtual production helping now? And then in the future, where do you really kind of see it, like how that communication and synergy is going to go? Yeah, so right now, virtual production is uh, fixing the part of the movie making process that is uh, maybe not the most efficient financially, right? Like a car process. Like, good luck putting an A-list actor or several A-list actors in a car on a road, shutting that road down, getting permits. So yeah, of course, sound stages with this stuff makes sense. So virtual production is like stopgap. Eventually, I think it'll turn into its own sort of tool to make films in. So then you're going to start to have really, really novel and amazing use cases that we're not just seeing just yet. So right now, we're trying to replicate things that already exist. We're going to go to a place where it can only be done with VP. That shot is impossible any other way. So then for people that are working in Unreal and like how we have Satomi here, uh, for productions that are happening, 
there are people that are pre-setting up the Unreal, but are there people like on the ground floor as the, the footage is happening and being filmed that need to know Unreal and be working yeah. with it right there? Absolutely. So yeah, uh, if you are the type of personality that likes high pressure environments <laughs> and Unreal, be on set as an Unreal artist or Unreal technician. Um, for the filming of our movie, we had a disguise operator and to his left was Irene, who was our Unreal artist. And all her job was to check the scenes, load it correctly, make sure everything is where it should be. So it was like, you know, a pre-step to running this. So as this scene was running, she was loading the next one, getting that ready and so on. And this guys could handle it. Yeah, and yeah, we, it was just like, you know, in a sequence of things. Now, what about uh, practical effects? So let's say that uh, we wanted to be inside a cavern yeah. that had uh, water, and yeah. we're going to splash up some water. Yeah. Can we do that by the volume? I think so, yeah. It, but this is maybe too small of a volume to do that in. Oh, yeah. uh, but, you know, there are some giant volumes, and uh, there's a lot of smoke, water. I've seen, uh, you know, shallow swimming pools be built in volumes that are maybe knee high and then you put paddle boards on them. Yeah, and then you could do full on ocean scenes and stuff with very little water. It, wait, so in the, hang on, wait, wait. Yeah. <laughs> so it was in a volume in that a people volume. were on a paddle yeah, board? Yeah, so you can actually put a small swimming pool in here and then mask it in a way, blend the seams. So it looks like, and the beautiful thing about water is it reflects all the stuff, right? Yeah. So it really is convincing. It, that, that's crazy because the only thing that I am familiar with that does anything like that is uh, if you've ever been to the Universal Studios backlot, they have a tram tour. Shout yeah. out to Universal Studios. Um, <laughs> and they have this huge like sky thing that they set up. And there's yeah. a bunch of water right there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I can't even fathom how much money that that would cost yeah. to go there. Mm -hmm and film literally like you were just talking about yeah. a paddleboard scene, right? Yeah. I got this 15 mi mi yeah. second paddleboard scene yeah. that's gonna cost me $75,000 yeah. versus- It makes no sense. Yeah, it's yeah. crazy. Yeah. That's wild. So you could do a lot, and then uh, a lot of the, let's say like you have a wide desert landscape, uh, you could just throw down some sand in here, blend the seam, right? So where the sand meets the screen, you can do clever things with the digital content. And now you have a desert you could shoot into. You could do wide shots. You can track shots depending on the size of your stage. That's awesome. Yeah. Uh, so as far as working knowledge of Unreal, um, you know, the, the big thing I think is there's some people that are going to be doing just different aspects of it, right? There's a lot of different real-time stuff that you can do. Pivoting specifically into this, so like for environment and all that jazz, away from like, uh, let's say like real-time characters and yeah. stuff. If you were gonna make that transition or even there being any kind of benefit for generating Unreal characters, is there a place for that for something like this? Yeah, we've seen, uh, so Unreal has a, a technology called MetaHumans. I think a lot of you have heard of it. So MetaHumans are digital humans. You can customize them in any shape and form. You can put MetaHumans in the background as crowd, as extras. I've seen that done. There's a movie called Fathead, which is a short film, and that they used exactly that. Yeah, I actually, I think we were at a, a volume, and uh, they just had all these people like walking around, sure, like and yeah. walking around, which yeah. is really exciting. The other thing that I'm very curious about, and it's kind of hard to see on on the other side of the screen right now. But what we're looking at here, uh, it actually looks pretty good. But on the outer, uh, it's a little bit pixelated. But however, if yeah. we move, right. when we move, it always stays yeah. smooth. It always looks good. Yeah, so How does it? Oh, yeah, we yeah, can let's, we'll let's, take a, uh, let's walk. a little stroll so, over yeah. here. <laughs> so it's always beautiful back there. Yeah. So here's what's happening. Disguise is throwing a lot of render power into just this inner square, inner frustrum, what the camera can see because that's the most important bit. The camera wants to pick up beautiful render without any flaws. The outer stuff is really for lighting, right? Mm -hmm. So this guys can choose to not render that as well. And so you can kind of direct your horsepower at the thing that matters. And the reflections are gonna look really good too. Right, exactly. The reflections aren't, aren't really gonna pick up the pixelations and everything else. 
It's, yeah. it's wild too, because you get into the stuff like uh, ray tracing technology, yeah. right? That is this new thing. Well, it's not a new thing, but this that you have to do and kind of get everything to get all these really nice reflections on, especially stuff like cars, like you were mentioning yeah. in water. But with this, then you can just, you can just skip that whole step. Yeah. I know we keep talking about yeah. it, but uh, so let's see. Uh, we, we got another question here. Um, are people who have knowledge of Unreal that complete the accelerators program getting work? Or is there a lot of additional training? You know, it's not as simple as completing the accelerator and finding work. I wish it was. Uh, we do need a lot of people to join this industry. There is no substitute for on the job training and your, you know, your 10,000 or 1,000 hours, if you will. So the accelerator and Unreal's fellowship program, all those programs are meant to put you at a competency level. And then from there, you are allowed, you can then walk into a stage comfortably, do a few shows, get your hours and then become the expert that you want to be. If that but, makes sense. But the, the virtual production accelerator accelerates. That's it. So <laughs> what would generally take you, you know, a few years to learn, you learn in four days. Having said that, that knowledge is your baseline knowledge. You still need on the job knowledge. So you have to be in a stage like this for a while to really understand all the nuances of it. So when you bring people for the first time, they've never seen a volume before. Right. right? What's like the exciting thing that you just love to show them that is just like, okay, stand right there. L <laughs> let me show you this thing. What's like that, that thing? It's usually an unreal scene. Uh, and then, yeah, exactly what we did. We move stuff around in the scene. So uh, we have a scene of the interior ramen shop, which I don't think is loaded right now. And um, it's the walls can move. Oh, really? Yeah. And so in camera, all of a sudden the room is deeper or shallower. It's pretty insane. Yeah. Yeah. So that, that's one of the ones that's my go to. So, yeah. 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 And that's got to be really exciting, too, because, again, it's it's just it's it's so phenomenal to see that look, because usually you only get that kind of shock and awe when people are at the movie. Yeah. Right? They're already seeing it finished and completed. Yep. But here it's just all happening. It's in happening real in time. real time. And you're seeing the how the sausage is made. Yeah. Essentially. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I think for the most part, we're pretty much set. Did, was, there, was there anything else you, you, you had to, for us to take a look at? You know, uh, this is it for today. However, I do encourage you to find the local virtual production stage near you. There's quite a few of them around the world now. Ask for a tour, ask to see if you can do an internship, ask for anything and get to know those people, that team personally. Uh, it's a really good time to get in on this industry now at its ground level. In a few years from now, you're going to be a sensei. And then if uh, people want to keep up to date with you, uh, let's, let's get one more question. Hang on. I think we got one more question one more. in. We're, we're, we can't we're go home through. just yet. I know. We can't <laughs> go home just yet. We're going to wait for it. So what are the, some of the entry-level jobs yeah. uh, that one would apply for after... Uh, you know, doing all, all the prerequisites, obviously coming to Noman, learning some Unreal, yeah. and then, um, you know, going through the, this virtual production uh, yeah. course, what, what does that look like? Yeah, it depends on who you are as an individual. I think we all prefer different things. We're all unique snowflakes. So if you're the type of person that wants to create worlds, that you have this creative mind, uh, being an Unreal artist, junior Unreal artist is like, you know, gonna open up so many doors for you because Unreal artists are needed in not just media and entertainment, but in automotive and in industry and so on. So huge world. And then if you're the type of person that really likes to use their hands and like really wants to be on set, you know, just building things, LED technician is one of them. So Roe actually has a program called the Roe Academy where they teach you how to handle these things, install them correctly, calibrate them and so on. So LED technician is another entry level job that you could go for. Finally, you know, I know disguise operation takes uh, a few months, maybe a year to learn, but you could start with our free online courses. You don't even have to attend the accelerator. You can just go on our website and learn disguise. And now as you're getting better and better, that puts you in a world where you can be on the most incredible concerts on the planet. That's not bad. 
Yeah, I love I love uh, uh, a good concert. I think yeah. I saw uh, the Watch the Throne tour, and they had one of these, but it was like a giant oh, pillar <laughs> at the Staples Center. It was oh my god, out of control. Okay, so if people want to know more about what y'all are doing or ask you questions, how do they get in contact you? With where, where, where do they go? Yeah, so going back to our QR code there, so that is gonna take you to our virtual production accelerator page. That's just for the training program. Now, if you could go to our main website, www.disguise.one for whatever our company does, and then follow us on LinkedIn. So if you're on LinkedIn, just go to Disguise and please uh, subscribe us there. And you're gonna see not just stuff that I do, but also what our broadcast team does and our concert team does. And that's awesome. Well, I mean, we, this, this was super fun. If you have any questions on what Nomen can do for you and want to learn more about amazing stuff like this, go ahead and contact us at our website at nomen.edu. If you're curious about your creative journey and want to see how we can help, go ahead and send us an email at admissions at nomen.edu. And that's it. That's, that's everything. So I fulfilled my obligation. You're going to build one of these in my house now, right? Oh, wow. Well, uh, uh, let's, let's cut the camera. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see you guys next.